except for the butt kiss. I don't know that you could put that in a movie today. I think you might get in trouble for that. Well, good morning. It's great to see you guys this morning. Today, we're going to talk about hope. Let me read the series verse. Isaiah 7, 14 says this, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. When Isaiah wrote those words, Israel was losing hope. What was happening to them as, as they were being taken over and then they were uh, slowly being uh, distributed uh, into Babylon and other places, they were losing hope and, and their life, their way of living, everything that was happening, there was an upheaval. When Jesus was born, this same upheaval was taking place. Herod was an awful ruler. If you didn't know that, he was awful to his people. He was awful to the Jews. There was actually a cleansing that had taken place under his rule. Um, he, he was a crazy person. And yet, when we read the story of Christmas... And we see, for example, today we're going to talk about the Magi, the, we like to call them the wise men, coming. We, uh, we're reminded of hope. Now, I don't know if when you were a kid, how many of you had a stocking when you were a child? How many of you had a stocking when you were a child? So, for those of you who didn't hear me a few weeks ago, my mother never, uh, after she was just four or five years old, never had Christmas. Uh, she actually told me last week, that she actually never had a Christmas tree except one year when she was in 11th grade. Uh, her sister, uh, and uh, she begged uh, my grandfather to get a Christmas tree. So on Christmas Eve, he went out and got, you can imagine what Charlie Brown would have been proud of, that tree and brought the tree home. Uh, they decorated it quickly and then it was thrown out the next day. So she did not have stockings. She did not have Christmas but for those who wake up all over the world here in the next week at Christmas time, many won't have presents on the floor, but they will have a stocking. How many of you ever had your parents put fruit in your stocking? You had to have fruit. If you lived in Florida, guess what was put in a stocking? An orange was put in a stocking. That's now becoming a valuable commodity. Uh, uh, so I don't know. They may have to go with mangoes or something soon if we're not careful. But, but what happens? So kids are looking forward to this week. As parents, when our children were little, we were looking forward to that new bike or whatever and, and seeing the excitement that happened at Christmas time. Maybe we were looking forward to the time together. And as we get older, that just changes for us. And if you're not careful, because of life, you will lose hope. You, you won't have a desire to see anything happen. You'll forget what really matters. And as we go through life, one of the things we're going to talk about today, one of the things that happens is you will be exposed to deceivers in your life. People who trick you. And if you're not careful, you'll get stuck Right there, but I want us today to look at this idea of hope and to find the blessing where we're at, regardless of what's happening in your life. Listen, you may wake up this week and say, This is the worst Christmas I've ever had. You might wake up this week and say, It's the best Christmas that I ever had. I have no idea which where you're at. But the truth is, hope pervades, goes over all of these things. And so I want to encourage you today, and my prayer for you is to find. Hope at Christmas. So that's what we're going to talk about today. How to find hope at Christmas. And let me just give you what I want to encourage you to do through this whole sermon. When we try to find control, we tend to lose hope. Because the truth is, you and I can control very few things. If you've had a teenager, you've realized this very quickly. Right, Reed? Oh, yes. If, if you've been in traffic on I-4, you realize very quickly you do not have control. If you have been delayed at an airport, if you have been to the DMV, one of our wonderful DMV workers is here today, goes as quick as she can. It's the fastest sloth in the room, we're for sure. You've seen that video, right? You know, I'm, she's, I'm kidding with it. Okay. So if you're mad at me, let me know later. All right. So I want to encourage you, though, listen. Sometimes we lose hope because we focus so much on control and our plans. Maybe this year doesn't look like you had planned. Maybe this Christmas doesn't look like you've... Maybe you've lost a loved one. 
Maybe you were planning on something happening and it didn't happen. Maybe you thought your life would be in a certain place and it's not. I want to encourage you, if you'll let go of your plans and put your hope in Him, then even like Isaiah said, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago, we, thousands of years ago, we can find hope again. So number one, I want to encourage you to open your eyes to blessings. Open your eyes to blessings. Now we're going to talk about the Magi tonight, and I want to tell you how they came about. Most theologians believe that the Magi, the wise men, uh, kings in some cases they call them, but this word uh, and the gifts they brought uh, mean that they're probably from Persia. Well, there was a very special person that was taken into exile to Persia. Um, he had a lion's den, and uh, that was Daniel. And of course, he was friends with Rakshak and Benny, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, for those of you who don't watch Veggie Tales. And uh, Daniel, though, if you remember, after Daniel is in the lion's den, was promoted to the head of the wise men. He was the head magi. And so many theologians think that the reason the Persians would have known about a Jewish king coming, the Messiah coming, is because Daniel, hundreds of years before the time of Jesus, had shared what would happen when Jesus came. And so many scholars believe that when Jesus was born, that star rose and the Persians headed out so that we know, don't tell your manger scene, but we know that the wise men were not there at the manger. They were there later, probably years later. It doesn't really mess up the story. It, it probably wasn't in December, and that's okay. But the truth is, when they came, they came because of hope. They came because of what they had looked forward to, regardless of what was going on around them. And here's what it says in Matthew 2, 1 through 6, part of the birth story of Jesus. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and they asked, Where's the one who's been born king of the Jews? Now you need to understand Herod was crazy, number one. Herod killed a lot of his family members. His family members tried to kill him. It was really just a wonderful relationship they all had. But Herod called himself king of the Jews. Did you know that? And so when the Magi show up and they said, where's the one who's called the king of the Jews? I'm sure Herod went right here. And they were like, nay, nay. You know, the one that was just born. We saw his star when it rose and we have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all of Jerusalem with him. Let me tell you something about King Herod. King Herod was always disturbed. He was disturbed. King Herod was probably, most theologians think at this time, this was about 6 BC. Uh, uh, just so you know, uh, we probably didn't get the calendar right on the birth of Jesus when we, we went back and did it. And during this time, many think that he was already dying. And he knew he was dying. So what Herod did, he was such a nice guy. He went and put the head Jewish leaders in captivity and told his guards, when I die, kill them so that there will be mourning in Jerusalem when I die. What a wonderful person. He was disturbed. And so when he was disturbed, everybody was with him. And then it says, when he called together all the people's chief priests and the teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, Judah, are no means the least among the rulers of my people. A ruler, excuse me, the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. We have to open our eyes to blessings. See, even with a disturbed king, even from a distant land, the wise men knew to seek Christ. I'm sure their travels were not easy. They had Roman roads for part of their travel. Roman roads were great. But you remember at the end of the story, they're warned and they go back a different route, which means they had to go home on not Roman roads. They would have to go a different way home because there were Roman soldiers every mile and they had ways to communicate and look for people and 
So they went home a different way. It was not easy, but they were looking for Jesus. I don't know what your year is like. Your travels this year may be difficult. It may be a struggle. You may feel lost. Do you realize God could have told the Magi exactly where to go when they got to Bethlehem and to go straight to Bethlehem? But he didn't. They went to the king. They didn't know exactly where to go. They had to find their way. You ever feel like you're still finding your way? In the middle of finding your way, I want to encourage you. Don't miss the blessings all around you. What's going on around you where God has blessed you? What's going on around you where you see a blessing of God, maybe even for someone else, and you can rejoice as that person is blessed? Ask God to open your eyes to his blessings. I love this next quote. Good Charles Dickens quote. For it is good to be children sometimes, and never better than at Christmas, when the mighty founder was a child himself. Number two, beware of deceivers, but keep going. Beware of deceivers, but keep going. Now, we've all had deceivers in our lives. Maybe you took your car to a shop and that shop deceived you into getting something done that somebody later said, you know, you didn't need to get that done. Maybe you hired a contractor for your home and they were glad to take the money and then they disappeared. Maybe you had somebody who called your, you a friend, but the whole time they were scheming behind your back and you found out later what they were really like. If you're not careful, you'll get stuck there. But in order to do God's will, you have to keep going. How do I know that? Because the Magi were dealing with a deceiver. Now, they didn't even know it at this time. They find out later. But the truth is, what did they do? They just did what they were called to do. Listen to what it says here. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. Now, the reason most people believe it was several years before is because, remember, he killed all the babies up to a certain age. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so I too may go and worship him. He had no plans to worship Christ. His plan was to destroy him. There are people like that in your life. They may come across like they want to help you. They may come across like they want to serve you. But the truth is they want to use you or hurt you. But don't let that stop you. After they had heard the king, they went on to their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. I talk to people all the time who had somebody deceive them or somebody hurt them. And years later, they're still talking about that and focusing on that. And it's kept them from doing what God wants them to do today. It's kept them from blessing the family members today that are with them. It's kept them from encouraging those around. Listen, as you go through life, you're going to get hurt. I'll never forget reading about Corey Ten Boom. If you don't know anything about Corey Ten Boom, her family uh, uh, protected Jews uh, in Holland during uh, World War II. And they were all put in concentration camps. The family was separated. And as soon as they got to the concentration camp, Corey Ten Boom saw her parents put in the line and sent to the gas chambers. Corey Ten Boom was able to forgive the guard that she remembered seeing there because later, after all of her family was wiped out, she was let out. And after World War II, she went through Germany preaching forgiveness. And actually, at one time, met one of the guards who had been part of that concentration camp and was able to forgive him. But later, Corey Ten Boom dealt with some Christians who had made a deal with her. They had signed some contracts with her. She had signed some things, and they ripped her off. And she was angry about it. She was frustrated, and she was talking to one of her friends one day, talking about how these Christians had ripped her off. She could forgive German soldiers who killed her family, but it was very difficult to forgive these Christians. And as she was talking to her friends, she went and got these letters out and said, look, I have proof. I have contracts. Look at all the things these people said they would do. And her friend looked at her and said, Corey, just like you always teach, you have to forgive you can't keep the letters. So Corey Ten Boone in her writing said that she went and burned all those letters. And said, I choose not to hold that against them anymore. 
When somebody hurts you, you don't have to make light of what they've done. You, you don't have to say that what they did was okay. You don't have to hang around them anymore. But you have to forgive them. You have to not hold the letters against them. Maybe for you, it's writing a letter to someone who will never read it and then burning it as proof that you're letting go of that hurt. Because all through life, you're going to have deceivers, people that hurt you. And just like the wise men, you can't stop there. You have to keep going. I want to encourage you today, if you're there, just to take a moment and ask God to give you the strength to forgive. Number three, rejoice and give where hope is found. Now, remember the Magi. We all know that the wise men brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh, very physical things. I want you to just close your eyes for a moment. Imagine that in the year 2020, you were going to where Jesus is born. What gift would you bring? Now, don't just say, I would bring my love. I want you to look this way for a minute. The truth is, you probably gave him either something that was important to you or something that you thought would help him. You went out of your way to sacrifice. Why? Because you knew what was important and Jesus' life is the most important. Just like these wise men. By the way, we don't know how many there were. We know there were three gifts. They traveled all this distance and what did they do? The Bible says this, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. What does that mean? Joy beyond joy. When they began realizing we are doing what God's called us to do, they had joy beyond joy. And then it continues on coming to the house. By the way, it's a house now. They saw the child with his mother Mary and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, it's been many years I've taught on those three gifts. There's so many great sermons just tied up in those gifts. But here's the deal. We have to look like the wise men for opportunities where God is blessing. And when we find those opportunities and we find hope, we have to give to those things, whether it's physically, whether it's doing things to help people. I just want to give you an example of this. This week I got a letter from our child uh, in uh, Bolivia, uh, Paola, who we've adopted. We've done Compassion International for years, and we sent her a Christmas present, uh, a financial Christmas present to her and her family this year. And so she's actually holding the gifts that we got her. They live in the mountains and it's cold, so you'll notice she's got some sweaters and some clothes and some new shoes. And I especially like the new boots. Those are very cool. And then you see her family over there on the right. Or if you're watching online, it might be on the left. And what'd they buy? They bought food. Because that's what they needed. And from the very first year, many years ago, when we first, my children first wanted to adopt a child from compassion. One of the things we realized is when we give, we were actually giving hope to people who had a hard time finding hope. And in doing that, guess what? We became overjoyed. When I got this letter, I cried. Because I said, you know, it's a very small thing for us, but how you're helping people. Listen, what has God called you to do? What has God called you to give? It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter how much time you have. It doesn't, there's always something that God calls you to do. What To do what? To go and give where there's hope and to bring more hope. To help the hopeless to find hope again. To encourage somebody. One of the reasons we're writing letters to an, uh, what we used to call a nursing home, a, a center, is to give people hope this time of year. On a very tough year, to go out of our way any way we can to give them hope. How are you giving people hope this year? Is there anybody that, you, that God will put on your heart that you think, you know what, I should call that person. I should check on that person. I should go out of my way to do that for that person. It might be as simple as when you're walking out of one of the stores, that kettlebell ringing and you give some money in that kettle. And you know that you're blessing somebody. You're bringing someone hope this Christmas. I want to encourage you to do that and ask God, God, what should I give today? Beyond all of these things today, I want to encourage you not only to open your eyes to blessing, to not focus on those deceivers, but keep going. But I want you to give where hope is found. And to do that, you have to let go of control. 
You have to let go of, of wanting to be in charge of everything and say, God, I want to do your will today. If you're here today or you're watching online and you've never given your life to Christ, you can do that today. And I'd love to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian. And today can be the first day that you receive forgiveness. You know that Jesus died. The whole reason we celebrate Christmas is because Christmas leads to Easter. We celebrate Easter all year long at this church. All year long, we have the cross on the wall. All year long, we have the cross. This time of year, for just a few weeks, we celebrate Christmas. Why? Because it's proof that God came to us because we could not go to him. And if you're here today and you've never received that free gift of salvation, the Bible says he died to forgive your sins and my sins. And when you confess your sins to him and ask for forgiveness, ask him to come and take over your life. When you surrender to him, the Bible says the great exchange takes place and he takes your sin and gives you his righteousness. Maybe you're here today and you're a Christian. And like me, so often you get distracted so easily and away from hope. I want to remind you again this year. Hey, my prayer is, unlike a stocking, that Jesus would be the thing that you look for. What's he going to do in my life this year? How's he going to use me this year? How's he going to use me to be a blessing to others? Even in this tough time, how is God going to use me to give gifts to other people. That's my prayer for you this year. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we close. Father, thank you for these moments. I thank you for all you've given us. And Lord, I thank you for the hope we have not only on this earth that you can use us and bless us, but Father, the hope of heaven that causes us to live differently, to realize that life is not about now and now, but Father, we know in eternity there'll be no more pain, no more suffering. So Father, we want to help other people to find their way home, to give them hope in a world that's becoming darker every day. Father, I pray not only that you'd bless each one here, but bless those who are watching. Father, bless those in the parking lot today. Father, that those that would come this later this week, who maybe have been away from church a long time, would be drawn back to your light. Lord, we love you. Thank you for these moments. In Jesus' name, amen.